I V M. to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast, where each week we share the journey of travellers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. Hope you're all well and keeping safe. On the podcast today, we are honoured to have a very, very special guest, Varun Sachdeh is an award-winning writer, photographer, and slow traveler whose work has been published at distinguished publications like New York Times, BBC, Travel and Leisure, among many others. Varun is also the winner of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav videography competition organized by the Indian Tourism Ministry in 2022 for his work covering the Adivasi tribes and tribal culture in the states of Chhattisgarh and Odisha. Let's hop onto the episode and find out where Varun is taking us to today. So with that introduction, we'd love to welcome Varun Sachdeh, a slow traveler, writer and photographer to the Musafir Stories. Varun, thank you so much for being on the podcast and welcome. Saif, it's an honor. I have been following Musafir Stories since quite a long time and you guys are doing an incredible job you know, providing the platform to travelers who go off the beaten path. So I'm really happy to be here today. <laughs> Varun is being very, very, very humble, but uh, Varun, it's entirely our honor uh, to have you on the podcast. And like I was telling you, even before we started the recording, uh, Varun is really, really a breath of fresh air and uh, one of the travelers who actually stands out from the lot, from the Instagram travelers, let, I, uh, let me say. And I'm, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be uh, demeaning to anybody. I, I also count myself in that category who actually enjoys taking pictures and everything. But uh, Varun, is definitely one of a kind and we'll certainly find that out uh, during the course of our conversation uh, but one for first time listeners the introduction i gave about you is very short and concise why don't you speak a little bit more about yourself and your work sure so i started traveling in 2015 and that was when i quit my job and my very first trip was to south america and I spent one year without realizing and uh, it was like an eye-opening eye trip because uh, I learned so many things that otherwise you don't learn either via traditional educational means or even via the internet. And uh, one of the things during the South American trip that I realized was that um, the South America that I saw for the first three months, that was the colonial South America. So that is like saying that you have seen Goa and you have seen India, right? So mm -hmm. eventually I started digging deep. Slowly my Spanish picked up as well. So I started diving deep into the indigenous cultures of uh, South America. So I'm not just talking about like the Incas, but even other smaller groups that uh, live, still live in South America in that like old way. And I realized that uh, it's just mesmerizing like the culture they have is so profound so diverse and so little is known about them even today in this day of internet even today very little is known about them so then that gave me a different direction so i started traveling more towards like i started planning my travels more to incorporate indigenous cultures to spend time with them to learn more about them and uh, slowly that also kind of uh, led me to conflict zones of South America and Central America. So I visited some uh, like narcos controlled areas or FARC controlled areas of Colombia. I was on the cocaine highway, which includes uh, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua. And what I realized there was that what we see is a bigger picture. We just see the political picture. We don't see what everyday people go through. So then I started uh, visiting conflict zones to understand the struggles of everyday people, like the struggle for food, for education, for a good night's sleep, for safety and security that we take for granted. Like they, that gave another dimension to my travels. And then because of climate change and everything, I'm a nature lover. So I love spending time in the wild. So I started uh, visiting jungles, islands, hilltops, and started discovering of the, like, you know, 
places that are not on the map because I feel like um, in many ways the internet is paralyzing us. It is limiting us. So I just totally threw away all the, you know, like uh, guidebooks and blogs and everything. And I just followed local advice and local direction. And then I discovered places that you can't even imagine. And even though I discovered these places, I don't like I myself, I as a responsible traveler, I don't like post them on social media because I feel that they should be left as they are. And if somebody asks me, then I do guide them to get there. Uh, so wildlife, uh, indigenous tribes, Adivasis, native tribes, conflict zones and nature and of the beaten path or like not on the map places. So these like these are the core pillars of my travels. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing that. And I guess now uh, listeners can relate to uh, what my introduction meant when I say Varun is a different, uh, different category of traveler, right? And with that introduction in mind, um, where are you going to take us or what aspect of your travel are you going to show us today on the podcast, Varun? So today I'm going to take you to my favorite part of India, that is Ch- Chhattisgarh and Odisha. Both of them are like big states. Both of them are amongst the least visited states for a variety of reasons. But even in these huge states, we are not going to focus on the entire state. We are just going to focus on two pockets of these states. One is Bastar in Chhattisgarh. And in Odisha, we are going to go to... Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about like regions or districts as we call them here. So we are going to go to Koraput, Kotpar. Deomali Hills, Bonda Hills, and Malkangiri in Odisha, and Bastar and Dantewada districts of uh, Chhattisgarh. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for uh, kind of highlighting those as well. Uh, like you rightly pointed, uh, some of the still very underrepresented, and also to a large extent, they haven't been very uh, commercial so far, right? So, looking forward to covering these uh, places. Now, one of the first things that does pop up to mind uh, especially when you do mention these belts or these districts that you were mentioning is is that they're traditionally like associated to being areas on the red corridor being associated to uh, insurgency violence safety concerns and stuff like that Uh, is that still an issue like how much of that is largely things that are through the media or how much of that is a reality do you want to share from your own experience Sure. So um, some of the places that I mentioned, they are actually the very epicenter of the Red Corridor. They are the heart of the Red Corridor, but not all of them. And one thing that I can assure all the listeners is that because I personally have encountered coincidentally Maoist and Naxals in two to three different um, remote places but uh, they were very kind to me they were very helpful they they are not after travelers or everyday people their fight is uh, is against the administration against the government so even so like what i'm trying to say is that you can go with an open mind with a free mind without any fear so it's a very like it is because because of that there is not enough tourism which results in like lack of opportunities for locals so if we can keep that image aside, if we can keep the fear aside and if we visit, then there's like a whole virgin part of the country that's waiting for you with open arms. Absolutely. I think some uh, really good insights there and also will certainly help Ali some of the unfounded fears, right? Uh, obviously, there has been some history in the past, but like you mentioned, there is several layers to it and uh, there's a lot of uh, background to it, uh, but at least good to hear that at least from uh, travelers point of view uh, this is something that is certainly one should be okay to explore um, now in terms of um, I know uh, time of the year like uh, some parts of the year might not be very ideal to make trips to this part of the country uh, do you have any recommendations as to when is an ideal time to visit these places or if one is planning a trip in this part of the country when might be a good time Sure. So like as with most of the places in India, it's best to avoid the summers. So that is like starting from, I would say like March all the way up to June. So that's like the worst time to go. 
um if you want to see like if you want to see greenery if you want to see waterfalls then and if you don't mind a like a bit of rain then july and august are ideal months um if you don't like the rain then i would say that anywhere from september all the way to february is an amazing time to visit these places um again if you visit right after the monsoon then you will see like both bastar and odisha at their greenest and all the waterfalls will will have a lot of like force and water okay wonderful uh, thank you for setting that context too um now just jumping into the core of the conversation right um, obviously one of the key experiences from your travels that we wanted to cover off is your interactions and your experiences meeting with the uh, indigenous people of uh, this part of the country uh, right uh, the adivasis like we mentioned them or the tribals uh, the, the various tribes of the region right there's also not just like one tribe or anything like that uh, do you want to shed some light on that uh, like what your experience has been like uh, even outlining what the various tribes are um your interactions with them parts of these uh, states they found etc sort of like those types of things for on sure so all in all i spent uh, two months in these two parts with uh, eight different tribes and i'll mention the names of the tribe so on the chatisgarh side or on the bastar side i spent time with uh, muria maria halba and gon tribes on the odisha side i spent time with uh, durwa kond praja and bonda so these are the eight uh, eight tribes that i spent my time with something like one of the reasons why i like focus on tribal cultures is because it is a dying way of life these cultures especially their younger generations they are modernizing at a rapid pace and uh, with each dying culture we lose uh, hundreds of centuries worth of knowledge we lose with each dying culture so when you go when you visit when you meet each one of these tribes like they are just mind blowing like the knowledge they possess the arts that they practice um the their cultural practices their religious practices because even though they are kind of living in a i would say like a there, there is a battle going on between christian missionaries and hindus to pull them towards their side so they are also losing they are also losing their original religion so this is the ideal time to go visit and experience something that might not exist maybe 20 years later so um if let's say i want to start with just I, if i just give like some brief overviews of some of these tribes like some of the highlights then um i would like to introduce so this is the muria tribe so um just to give you a geographical perspective jagdalpur is the heart of uh, bastar so if you want to explore bastar you can base yourself in jagdalpur the first tribe that i'm going to mention that's the tribe that is the closest to jagdalpur so it's only like about an hour hour and a half away and this is uh, konda gaon and uh, kondagaon is actually also the um heart of bell metal so they create a lot of uh, metal craft and kondagaon is the epicenter of this art so and this and the muria people the muria tribals they are the ones who create all these bell metal objects and amongst them besides of course the metal craft you can there is one other practice which is on the verge of extinction and that is the um, the concept or the idea of guru mai guru mai are usually the elderly women now elderly women of the tribe who used to go from village to village and they used to sing songs and these songs these songs they carried like centuries worth of knowledge so they would go and these are the songs about the forest about animal movements about herbs about food and they would go from one village to another and they would sing these songs and then from that village they would acquire more local local knowledge then they would go to another village then they would again continue this so this was a very like old practice but now like i met one guru mai but now like this is the last generation or the last of them and they are already hitting like 60 70 years so you can imagine what will happen after 10 years 
and one common theme that i have come across throughout the world when i'm meeting indigenous tribes then that is that uh, the younger generations are not interested in learning about their own culture or carrying forward their cultural practices so that is why i go and i document these practices so that they like we don't lose them forever <laughs> we at least have yeah. some form of it like preserved in a way that is your um, muria tribe that's like one element or one aspect of the muria tribe then um, i would like to kind of i kind of is it okay if i swing between the states yeah for sure that should be okay fine okay so then okay then i would also mention the halba tribe so i spent, when i was uh, with the halba tribe i found out now i, I mean i don't know if there's a way if you can do a poll or something but uh, like i would ask this question to the listeners that um, how many of them are for and how many of them are against the dowry system yeah <laughs> i mean a lot of them would try to be on the ethically right side and say that it's uh, against right uh, that would be the natural response i'm assuming but uh, i'm keen to find out what or what you're up to with this so what if i suggest a dowry system that everybody in the world would agree to hmm. so i'll tell you the dowry system <laughs> yeah. so that's what I, that's what i'm saying like because there are so many of these things that you learn when you spend time with them that you realize that these guys these guys have figured it out you know so i'm going to explain the dowry system and this is particularly the halba dowry system mm-hmm. so in the halba dowry system when a guy and a girl they marry there are set rules that uh, you know like maternal uncles maternal grandparents paternal grandparents paternal uncles and aunts and everything from both sides of the um, union so like both from the bride side and the groom side they are supposed to give x amount in dowry to the other now what is the x amount the x amount are saplings <laughs> of different trees and it's not just one tree so like let's say mama right so like maternal uncle so maternal uncle is supposed to give 20 banyan trees or 20 sal trees or 20 mahua trees to the um, groom's family then the groom's family will return the favor with some other tree and these trees they are not private property they belong to the village and they are planted across the village mm-hmm. and their weddings are also like thought provoking the way their weddings work um they don't uh, so nowadays it's kind of changing they're kind of shifting towards uh, i would say like going round and round <laughs> uh, across the fire but the traditional mm-hmm. halwa wedding it usually takes place so they go they take they do their feras um a, like so they plant a tree a new tree a sapling and then they do their feras around the tree mm-hmm. and at the same time um the way like they construct so you know how we have these like mandaps and all like we kind of bring up all these uh, like big fat indian wedding stuff you know yeah. so mm-hmm. instead of instead of that for a wedding to take place a month or two months prior to the wedding across where the wedding will take place they have to plant x numbers of trees of different species and then only the wedding can take place in the midst of these new saplings and no two weddings can take place at the same in the same area so they keep so what they are doing is they are organically regrowing the forest through their dowry yeah. system through their through their wedding system wedding cultural practices and all so yeah. like <laughs> super interesting yeah here we are <laughs> on our high chairs calling ourselves modern and progressive and <laughs> these are the guys who are actually uh, yeah doing things that uh, that really matter right yeah i really wish everybody every one of us around the world not just in india can follow the dowry this dowry system right, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh yeah uh, i'm sure i hope there's like competition in this regards right who gives more or who gives more variety of plants and saplings like that kind of competition but yeah really i hope i have not come across this type of uh, system before so like one all these adivasi groups with whom i spent time they have one common so like even though they live in close proximity they are culturally very different from each other mm-hmm. so if you go to like you know you have uh, tribal hearts 
sometimes it might not be possible for people to go visit their villages because it takes a lot of time sometimes it takes me two to three days to visit a village where i find the information that i'm sharing here mm. because wow. there are a lot of factors it's very difficult to find the elders and then to find the translators and then to you know convey the message and then for them to trust you to share all this knowledge and all this information and all so you can visit these tribal hearts and in any given tribal heart you will hear languages from three different schools of language so like you know how we say like indo gangetic or tibeto burman right. or austro asiatic so these are very different from each other this, despite the fact that they are living in close proximity so so that is another angle so and but across across the different tribes the one motto that i always heard was jal jeevan jungle so water forest life very close to the earth basically very close to the earth they are not pastoralist they are not agriculturalist they are still hunter gatherers mm. they are still foragers mm. hunting is not so much a part of their life anymore because there are as we know like there are very few wild animals left but right. uh, i will also share one of the like hunting practices that they follow which will also is very also very eye opening and thought provoking but mm-hmm. uh, before that i'll focus more on the food and drinks and the foraging part of it because that is the core part of their life sure so the only thing the only thing that it depend on the outside world for are salt sugar mm-hmm. rice and tea Ev- everything else they forage from the jungle and when i was living with them every day we would go in the jungle and every day they would be like you know asking me like do you want to have like mushrooms you want to have root vegetables you want to have leafy greens or you want to have some other kind of uh, vegetable bamboo or something like that and at any given time because you know how they grow seasonally so at any given mm-hmm. time they have access to 15 to 20 kinds of leafy greens leafy vegetables uh same amount of root vegetables more than 30 kinds of edible mushrooms and similarly around 10 to 12 different kinds of vegetables like bamboo and stuff like all of this these they just grow wild so we would go every day we would like you know <laughs> go and forage for different uh, local varieties come back cook eat and they never overdo it they always do it very consciously to make sure that um, it gets time to regrow that the jungle gets time to regrow Mm-hmm. so if you ever get you know because nowadays we have all these like farm to table concept like this is like forest yeah. to table concept <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so it is a priceless experience if you ever get a chance just go to any like adivasi village and tell them that you want to eat like murga bhaji or you want to eat uh, media page or anything and then they'll take you in the jungle or even bamboo for that matter and then you, you can have it yeah really really interesting that uh, truly diy in a real sense here yeah, right in terms of uh, you making your own food and like i said forest to table concept as That's well um, and uh, in general uh, about the eating practices as well uh, do they vastly differ from tribe to tribe or uh, like a lot of them are around the same uh, principle but obviously depending on where they live and what's available they tend to use that and also between let's say uh, vegetarian non vegetarian options if i have to <laughs> break it up that way uh, w- w- what did you notice so actually um, even though they are like meat eaters but uh, meat is not frequently consumed and the reason behind that is uh, i will kind of bring into the hunting practice that they right. have mm-hmm. so it's all that is because that's also very interesting and it kind of even like uh, because nowadays we are living in the age of i guess uh, mass production of meat and everything you know so mm-hmm. this is very eye opening because um what they do with meat is they have besides like smaller game so besides think of like you know like wild chickens and all so besides smaller game any bigger game they only have a window of 12 hours when they mm-hmm. hunt the entire village village first of all they have a huge like celebration and everything then the entire village goes to the jungle around after sunset in the dark they all go to the jungle with their bows and arrows and they hunt so whatever they hunt in that next 12 hours is like the only big game that they consume during the throughout the year mm. now the beauty is that there are certain rules that they have to follow first and foremost 
they never hunt a female okay because female they, they believe that female has you know not they believe because female you know like female animals are like um they have the beauty of or the magic of procreation so they don't want to kill the source number 2 they never hunt an animal a male that is not hit puberty they want a male to at least breed once before they hunt to diversify the genetic pool so imagine like how advanced they were or they have been yeah. since <laughs> since time immemorial <laughs> yeah no for sure like a lot of these things we don't even tend to i mean yeah even in our own pro- practices like you said just whatever is available quickest and whatever is the quickest way to uh, like get it to your table and uh, everything is now factory produced or factory cut and all of that right so look at uh, which direction we are going and look at where they are coming from where that so, from and like interesting yeah and we recently figured out like genetics dna on all these things natural selection but they knew long back that we have to ensure like a diverse genetic pool so that it yeah. is like it optimizes survival of the species yeah yeah truly <laughs> very progressive in a real sense right not just uh, uh, on paper to sound very scientific and intellectual about it but uh, they're actually doing it on the ground ground exactly yeah. and they like yeah. time tested practice right they've been doing it they've been following it since uh, centuries so <laughs> yeah yeah for sure thank you a lot of uh, new learning today <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like literally like every every day with them is like uh, it's just golden you know every day you yeah. realize that how much they know about nature and how much we can learn from them rather than imposing our development model or our vikas model on them yeah so and i think one one thing that really saddens me because recently i was in um, bihar and uh, jharkhand and uh, i it, like it really saddened me a lot that um, the tribal cultures over there they have been lost so when i went there and when i was talking to the people and when i was telling them that you know i want to meet the tribal tribals you know like the real tribals who are still following their practices um mm-hmm. they all kept saying this thing like this they all kept using this uh, word which really irritated me and that was that oh like tumko pichde hue work se milna hai like you want to meet mm-hmm. backward people and i'm like please don't use that you know right don't use it if you don't understand them yeah your your lack of understanding doesn't make them backward so that is also like this this is also like another i would say like um wrong image of the tribals that they are backward they don't have knowledge and we need to educate them we need to bring them to the mainstream instead of that i think we have to learn from them we should preserve their culture we should promote their culture and we should learn we should adapt these practices yeah if anything i think it's becoming very clear which of us is the backward <laughs> uh, in terms of everything we are doing right to destroy things and destroy nature right uh, yeah it's clear but uh, yeah i think the key is coexistence and uh, learning from each other right i think that's the important bit here um hopefully this is something like i said it's already a challenge that we are losing out on a lot of these things because these are uh, dying way of life last thing you want to do is speed up that process by this type these type of practices and trying to bring them into the mainstream rather than treat them as the way they are and learn from them precisely um, but yeah it's, it's yeah certainly some uh, very interesting things to do and uh, like you mentioned as well, well passing earlier on uh, one of the easier ways to learn uh, about these different tribes also would be the huts right the huts are basically markets you could say right uh, markets of of kind that usually happen in a village or in a place that's in the proximity of two or three villages where tribes and indigenous people from different villages come in do you want to share a little bit more about that in terms of uh, what these are uh, how the how your experience visiting these were and what types of uh, things i want to say merchandise but uh, yeah there's everything from food to the their uh, produce to the handicrafts they work on like a lot of things are available in these huts right do you want to shed some light on that varun sure so huts are weekly markets 
so like until 10 years ago they didn't even have most of these tribals they didn't even have the concept of money they used to follow the barter system and they live like you know either up on the hills or they live uh, deep in the jungle or by the riverside so they don't live close to traditional markets or cities or villages so they have their own cluster of villages in like far off from the roads so each day of the week wherever you go be it bastar be it dantewada be it odisha you can go to any big town or village and ask them like where is like aaj ka haat kahan hai or where is the haat today and you can visit these haats and essentially these haats are markets where all these tribal people from different uh, tribes they come and they sell their produce and they exchange sometimes even today like they have barter system amongst the tribes so mm-hmm. you can purchase and you can experience lot of different products i'll just give you a few names so metal craft is huge so you can buy mm-hmm. uh, metal craft or metal items you can buy their traditional dress so their traditional dress is essentially just um, one wrap of cloth that they wrap around their body so you can purchase that you can purchase tribal jewelry you can purchase bamboo products they are excellent um, artisans of bamboo products so they create like like unbelievable pieces out of bamboo so i would say i would highly recommend buying bamboo products some of them are also into pottery so you can even like purchase if you find not a lot but you can find some um pottery items as well uh, when it comes to food and alcohol so they are also they also like distill and uh, brew their own alcohol and um, the things that they brew are like amazing <laughs> like some of the most <laughs> unique unique drinks you will come across in the world so i would i would mention three of them and because you know when you visit these huts you have these different sections so you can also buy a lot of forest produce or not forest produce but like whatever they have forage so you can buy a lot of these leafy vegetables mushrooms and root vegetables that i mentioned that you won't find elsewhere that's also a great uh, these are also great things to buy and then cook you know if you can you can take it back home or you can cook at your place or maybe cook at a at the hotel or resort wherever you are staying um mm-hmm. so coming back to alcohol so they have a whole section in the back of the hut where there will be all these <laughs> so like alcohol you would see that alcohol is always sold by women okay interesting which also which also tells you a lot <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> like uh, show me show me a city show me a bar in a city in a metro where women are the like like kind of uh, like centerpiece of like these bars they are selling alcohol or they are waitressing or they are bartending right usually yeah, like yeah, it true. is kind of it's kind of considered unsafe for women to be around men and alcohol and it's a deadly combination <laughs> but yeah. uh, um so that that tells you a lot about their culture too right that all the 100% of them they'll all be women would be serving alcohol um there are three main kinds of alcohol that they serve one is what they call uh, sulfi or uh, mm-hmm. tari what is also known as known as uh, tari in other parts of uh, india and this is essentially you have the palm tree they make a cut in the palm tree they place a uh, a clay pot under the palm under the cut and then like that pot fills up in like 8 to 10 hours so they do it around sunrise and around sunset they bring it down so it's like a white liquid and mm-hmm. drop by drop starts seeping in so it's a lot like maple syrup how people collect maple syrup in canada so yeah. drop by drop it gets collected and it gets fermented by the yeast the natural yeast in the environment so nothing is added to it so and then in the evening like everybody sits around so i have actually i've had you can also have it at the um you can you can have it at the huts i've also had it in the villages you can go to any village and tell them that you want to try tari and uh, they'll like bring the pot down for you and um, the way they give it to you the way they serve is also very beautiful like they take a leaf and they make a yeah. boat out of it and they put like two twigs to make sure that the leaf holds itself and then they pour it in the leaf <laughs> I, i think uh, so it was called as uh, dona or uh, whatever the, the little leaf uh, the, the, or the cup they make out of leaf right that's what it was called uh, right. basically like a cup for you exactly like a cup paper boat kind of a thing like a yeah. boat of it so <laughs> and so yeah. that is one uh, then they have uh, sulfi and mahua mahua is the mm-hmm. only known alcohol distilled from flowers mm-hmm. 
so that is also something you can try there mahua sulfi tari these are some alcohols that you can try in these huts and you can they even give you by the bottle so you can purchase that as well mm-hmm. food food wise um they don't sell like a lot of cooked food they don't bring any cooked food so you can only buy raw raw vegetables craft like mm-hmm. arts and crafts and then alcohol at the huts and um, one more thing i would like to bring in at this point is that um, january and february these are the best months if you want to like like if you don't want to travel like i do if you don't want to go too deep and still experience different cultures because um, throughout january and february there are lots of tribal festivals and these are anywhere from 3 days to 4 days to 7 day affairs so you can visit these tribal festivals and then you'll get a very um, amazing idea of what the culture is you can interact with them and you can learn more about them and they'll have like different dates different tribal groups they celebrate different festivals so okay uh, anything specific that uh, you'd like to call out in terms of uh, these festivals or do you, uh, that you got a chance to be a part of varun so actually i haven't witnessed one yet so mm, okay. i i've yeah i've not i've not visited in those months so they are kind of with uh, they are aligned with the winter solstice Mm-hmm. and uh, they are again like kind of like um, what we have like pongan uh, sorry pongal then baisakhi yeah. makar sankranti in gujarat so it's kind of it has to do with the winter solstice mm. uh, but i haven't visited but you will get to see a lot of uh, like folk songs tribal dances and other kind of like banter and sports and everything so they are very like rich and colorful and happening all the time so and it's they are very open so it's not like what we think of festivals where you have to like get tickets or anything they just and they happen in yeah. the wild so they just happen right, in the right. jungle or among trees and you can just like feel free to go uh yeah i came across a couple of interesting ones we could uh, definitely uh, i think something that is spoken about a little bit at least is the Bastar Dasehra right it's supposed to be one of the longest running festivals in the world it claims to be right a 75 day festival i don't know any other festival that runs for that long but uh, did you hear anything about uh, this this particular festival uh, also very different from uh, our uh, version of dasehra that's usually celebrated in the rest of the country i, I would say right so i actually i was there for bastar dasehra in 2021 okay. uh-huh. and uh, i attended it for me it was a huge disappointment yeah, why, so, why would you say so um because like it was very strange like it was it was kind of like just a think of it as like a carnival or like you know julus like a procession mm, okay. so it was it was a procession of the three main deities of uh, bastar so that That's is right. danteshwari devi the two others so like danteshwari devi and then there is a sister one i forgot her name and then another one there are three deities and it's essentially just a procession of these three they make uh, like a huge uh, right right the it? chariot so uh, chariot chariot so they make a chariot yeah. out of uh, like bamboo and wood and everything and then they just kind of go around take take the three deities around so it's like a rath yatra kind of a thing but nothing like thing that highlights the local culture so it was an all right experience for me and it's very crowded so that's another thing that <laughs> mm. okay but yeah it's supposed to be a 75 day festival i'm sure uh it's hard for anybody to be like uh, unless you have a lot of time and home like to uh experience the whole of it but it concludes at the same time that actual the sera happens around india right uh, other parts of india yeah it clearly doesn't seem to be having its origins and the story of rama and now or anything like that so it's different in that way and yeah like you mentioned it seems to be tied to the chariot and uh, i guess a little closer to the festivals to be seen in puri and odisha right so maybe a right. uh, little closer to that um, but yeah very interesting and the less for just for being a 75 day festival <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's something um and also just quickly going back to the hearts right uh, you you did touch upon a lot of the things uh, one interesting thing i came across as, as well <clears throat> i don't know if i'll call this a delicacy but uh, ant chutney red ant chutney is something that was very peculiar i came across uh, any, any experience uh, coming across that in one of the huts you visited parun yes i'm i'm glad you mentioned this because this also <laughs> reminded me of the fact that um, if you can't attend any of the other huts 
make sure to attend the sunday heart that takes place in jagdalpur okay so you don't have to go anywhere plan a weekend trip and bathe yourself in jagdalpur go early in the morning and just visit it's called i think it's called the sanjay gandhi market where the heart takes place in jagdalpur and that is where you will see the ant chutney the red ant chutney so what the locals the tribals they believe is that the sting of the ant chutney has antibiotics so there are two ways of uh, interacting with it um one is to consume it to consume the ant chutney and these are live ants these are not dead ants so they they give you again they give you in this in this leaf and these are all live red ants and you just eat it with like pakoda or with anything roti or anything um if you have a serious injury or a serious ill like serious sickness then what they do is um when you go like they you will see these like metal pots in which they'll have all these live red ants and then they'll be serving you the red ant in these paper cups or oh, sorry in the leaves if you have a serious ailment then they will ask you to place your hand in the pot <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> it's like trial by fire <laughs> just like yeah trial trial by fire so they say like uh, you know like death by a thousand stings kind of a thing so. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so oh, they will <laughs> Did you so, try? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. I hope you didn't get yourself bitten, but did you at least try tasting it? No, no. I'm a hardcore vegetarian, so. Oh, okay. okay yeah, okay. I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't try it. I just saw it. So. <laughs> yeah, very, very peculiar, and um, I think these are also a little different from at least the. Uh, these are not the little red ants or the black ants you see. I mean, at least in South India. The, the, the not the small ones that you see these are pretty big red ants right um that, that's what i noticed in the couple of videos i saw of it i think uh, one would definitely need like a uh, flush down using selfie or one of the other <laughs> or the local uh, brews brews i think after you've had a red ant chutney but uh, i don't know i came across this while looking it up that uh, gordon ramsay like he had it on one of his menus apparently the red ant chutney but uh, i won't call myself that adventurous to it I don't want to me yet <laughs> but interesting to know that this is an option in case you're interested um and uh, another thing uh, interesting thing i came across as well again and uh, this will always have people on both sides of the aisle uh, but um the traditional cock fights right that is also something that some of these hearts are known for i understand right uh, is that is that as to or has that been your experience as well like uh, did you come across these happening at the hearts yeah 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 they take place at all the hearts or at least all the like i would say slightly remoter hearts and uh, people gamble so they train their cocks and uh, yeah. then there is a usual like gambling pot and uh, mm-hmm. so essentially they tie like a blade to yeah. to one of the foot of the hen and then on of the cock and then they fight and whichever one cuts the other one first wins yeah yeah an older and uh, traditional practice I, i think in some of the villages at least in south india as well you see the practice but uh, again like this has people on divided on either side of the aisle right some are uh, strictly against it and another view as these are traditional practices and they've just been carrying on for years but there's something interesting that i found on these um, parts as well right uh, one of the things that does draw in large crowds i understand uh, basically form a ring of people around you and a lot of commotion and shouting and yelling and all of that goes yeah. on <laughs> large large yeah. drunk crowds as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true uh, but yeah i would uh, pretty much call them as um, let's say our version of the malls right you get uh, your food you get to meet people you get to buy things and you're also getting some entertainment right so that way you could i guess equate it uh, yeah it's not the same thing obviously but in your cities you have malls and places to hang out and uh, for the tribals these are their uh, versions of the malls i could say right wow, in that's, my that's a bit, <laughs> little that's, like, that's an excellent uh, corollary like open air malls <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah just a lot of unique experiences right very very different from anything you usually would associate with in a traditional sense what we like to call as travel right but even from uh, let's look at it from places to see type of a perspective what would you like to call out from 
this area, this belt that are, let's say, uh, just marvels of nature or beautiful things one should check out uh, as to make the trip and not just interact with the locals, but also like see things. Varun? Yes, I'm glad you asked this because uh, there's, this, there's a whole lot more to these places, even beyond the tribals. And um, across India, if you take the Northeast out of the equation, then mm. Chhattisgarh and Odisha, especially this belt, has mm-hmm. the most like untouched and virgin forest that you can experience. Mm. And that is, again, the reason behind that is both the Naxals, who are not mm. allowing any kind of mining, and the tribals who are the protectors of these forests and they are ex- like not just the protectors but they are also like expanding the forest through their practices that i mentioned so mm-hmm. one can just lose oneself in the forest so i will tell you like there is kanger valley national park so i i would highly recommend people to visit kanger valley national park you can do bike trips you can do four wheel drive jeep safaris you can do boat rides there are all kinds of things that you can do to explore Kanger Valley. Then you can, uh, so Bastar is the land of waterfalls. So mm-hmm. Chitrakoot is known as um, the Niagara Falls of India. You can visit Chitrakoot Falls. You can swim in um, Tiratgarh Falls. And mm-hmm. uh, Tiratgarh is one of those falls where you can actually go behind the fall. Uh, and there's also like a small pool. So you can swim in the pool as well. There are excellent trails. If anybody is interested in trekking and hiking, there are excellent trails across uh, both Bastar and Chhattisgarh. Sorry, Bastar and Odisha. Mm -hmm. One of the most famous ones is the Dolkal Trek. And there's an interesting story behind that as well. So it is believed that um, the fight between um, Parshuram and Ganesh took Mm -hmm. place in these hills. And when finally... Parshuram swung his axe and threw it at Ganesh. It chopped Ganesh's uh, Ganesh's one two like one uh, tusk. So that's why you see Ganesh mm. has like one half tusk and one full tusk. Right. So mm. it took that tusk off and the axe like hit the hill right around where the Dolkal peak is. And people say that that is why this is also the iron rich area of India <laughs> because yeah. uh, because Parshuram's axe had a lot of iron like it was an iron axe. So. And uh, I would also like to briefly take the listeners across the border because I feel that we haven't talked much about Odisha. Mm-hmm. So I, I would like to mention some amazing places in Odisha as well. So first of all, when you go from Jagdalpur, when you cross the border, the first major town that you will hit is Kotpar. And mm-hmm. this is like K-O-T-P-A-D, Kotpar. And uh, Kotpar is home to Kotpar Vivi. So this mm. is like geographical um, weaving style. Right, so right, right. Uh, yeah, this, this has is, a geotag also, I think, right? Geotag, geotag. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. So Kotpar weaving. Uh, so you can visit the Kotpar town, and there are two two Padmashris whose houses you can visit, and they will show you the Kotpar weave themselves. So that will be like a very um, enlightening experience, very enriching experience. Then further on, another, I would say, 100 kilometers or so, you will hit what they call the Deomali Kati or mm-hmm. the Deomali Hills. Now, Deomali Hill is the highest point of Odisha and it is right out of a Monet painting. Both the road up to the hill, the surroundings, the villages that are in the valley. So it's a valley with a summit. So the villages in the valley, so you will meet uh, Kond Adivasis there, you will meet Praja Adivasis. These are the main inhabitants of the valley. But it is like mm-hmm. stunning, like it's right out of a painting. And you can just keep like, you can just keep exploring without any GPS or anything. And you will come across stunning sites, you will see waterfalls, you will see peaks, you will see these uh, idyllic villages or hamlets tucked in like the cliffs and mountains. So Dev Maligati also I highly recommend to anybody who visits this part. And then coming further south, another 100, 150 kilometers, you reach Bondagati. Now, Bondagati was inaccessible 20 years ago. Bondagati was essentially what Sentinel Islands are today. So anybody who approached Bondagati used to face arrows by the Bonda tribals. <laughs> mm, interesting. 
So, but it has opened up in the last 20 years. Again, there is no like tourism infrastructure. Um, there is one village and in that village, there is only one uh, like guest house, very simple, basic guest house and two to three dabas. And from there, you can approach Bondagati. You can go up. It's like a very uh, curvy road. You can go up. And again, it's a very beautiful, very mesmerizing, very untouched. And like you will see these um, mud brick houses, clay houses with thatched roofs. And you will meet the Bonda people. You'll get to learn about their culture, which is like amongst all the cultures, it's amongst the most untouched or one which is like the furthest from modernization. That area is also very beautiful. Then from Bondagati, you can take, you can come back to like Dantewada side. So Dantewada is also beautiful. Around Dantewada also, there are some like scenic spots. This is back in Chhattisgarh, right? This is back in Chhattisgarh. If you are coming from uh, Bondagati to Chhattisgarh, because Bondagati is like the kind of like the southernmost point of uh, Odisha. Southernmost in the mm-hmm. sense, like then from there, you can kind of again come back into Chhattisgarh. Instead of taking the highway, you can take the back road. And again, this back road would uh, take you through very, think of them as like time time warp villages mm. and with like backdrops of mountains and jungles and there's a river flowing by and you are just going through these. And like one more thing that you would encounter in most of these villages is that uh, a lot of the inhabitants, a lot of the villagers, a lot of the tribals, they don't wear any clothes, mm-hmm. which is for me, it is very poetic because like that is a very like, you know, natural way of existing. So when you take these back roads, you would come across like hand pumps under which like uh, the whole village is bathing, especially like the grandmoms and the mothers and the children, they're applying mud to their bodies and under the hand pump, they are taking a shower or bathing same with men so you will see like all these things that you like it's like beyond our thought process or beyond our imagination so that particular road is also very offbeat and very interesting to explore just it's like a stretch of around uh, 40 kilometers and mm-hmm. uh, very few people frequent that road you won't come across any other vehicle on that on that little strip yeah. Yeah, I think like you mentioned at the beginning also uh, before we had the chat that uh, one could potentially like do a two-month itinerary and still have a lot of things you did not touch or still remaining, right? So there's a lot, lot to explore. It's just that the place has been very underserved and also not um, explored as much. One of the reasons, like you mentioned, was lack of uh, tourist infrastructure, which might actually be a good thing, at least <laughs> for now as well. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, even from your experience, like for uh, for somebody who's visiting from outside in terms of uh, staying and even the language, right? That was another bit I did not bring up. Um, I failed to bring up at the beginning. Um, how did you get about uh, like these two aspects, like living plus uh, the language aspect? So there are like, see, if you don't want to dive too deep, if you just want, let's say you want to go for a one week trip, right? And then language isn't an issue. Um, first of all, you can, so I like kind of give an itinerary now so that listeners can have a better idea if they want to plan a trip there. So, um, you can fly or take a train to Raipur, which is the capital of Chhattisgarh. Then from there, you can either fly to Jagdalpur, which is the capital of, or the district headquarters, Bastar district headquarters. So you can either take a direct flight from Raipur to Jagdalpur, or you can take an overnight bus from Raipur to Jagdalpur. Base yourself in Jagdalpur for Bastar. In Jagdalpur, you will find accommodation for all kinds of budgets. So you have like really good resorts. You have something for backpackers as well, for families, for couples, for all all, uh, types of travelers. Um, Food-wise also, all kinds of restaurants. Um, Similarly, there you can arrange your transportation there. So you can hire a taxi in Jagdalpur and uh, then the taxi driver will take you around. So from Jagdalpur, you can make day trips to Chitrakut, Tiratgarh, Dholkal, Kangar Valley, Kangar Valley, Dantewada, all these places. They're within like two to three hours distance. Mm-hmm. So you can easily incorporate easily incorporate the Buster's um, segment. Within like three to four days, you can visit all these places, including some huts, couple of tribal villages, so you get a sense of everything, nature, culture, 
and then from there you can move to um koraput so koraput is uh for jagdalpur is to bastar so go from jagdalpur to koraput base yourself in koraput and koraput also has uh, koraput also has some religious importance i forgot what it is i didn't do the religious part of it so koraput has all kinds of uh, hotels and restaurants and resorts and other infrastructure so you can base yourself in koraput and then go to devmali ghati and then next so you can from going from jagdalpur you can visit kotpar you know spend uh, about a couple of hours in kotpar then get to koraput stay in koraput then next day from koraput you can go to devmali ghati and the following day you can go to bonda ghati and come back to chatisgarh so that's like your seven day trip seven day itinerary of this particular part okay brilliant i think that's really helpful uh because yeah a lot of them uh, i don't know if they have the capacity to do much uh, like a roughed out trip like you did right two months living mm-hmm. with the tribes there and spending time living with them and eating and uh drinking what they were and visiting their hearts and stuff like that so i don't know if everybody will have the opportunity but it was really great uh, actually learning about a lot of these things for me personally too um well, what's the best way for uh, listeners and uh, readers to follow follow your work and uh, especially this part of your work where you're capturing uh, these really last and dying of practices and uh, lifestyles so i have i write on my own travel blog and uh, it is called winds of travel w i n d s winds of travel dot com um lately i have been creating videos as well to give people a better visual idea of these places and people and uh, my youtube is the same winds of travel um instagram i also post some photos with short stories and snippets and my instagram handle is uh, third world storyteller Okay, we'll make sure to include these as well. Uh, yeah, brilliant social media handles to follow to and learn and experience a few of these things. Thank you so much, Varun. Uh, firstly, for uh, coming to the Musafir Stories, right? Like I said, it's an honor for us to have you, uh, such an accomplished traveler and such a different kind of traveler, really. Secondly, uh, there's so much out there to learn and discover and uncover that uh, a lot of us are really unaware of. So, thank you for opening our eyes to. the underappreciated and uh, unexplored parts of india and the people of india really right the tribes of india that in uh, in one sense are the true inhabitants of this land so thank you so much varun it's really uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast thank you for hosting me self and it was sheer joy talking to you and it like it felt like we are conversing over a cup of tea somewhere in some <laughs> remote part so it was an honor and a true pleasure to be here and to talk to you Thank you Varun the pleasure is all ours That was just another great episode on the Musafir stories Make sure to show us some love by sharing the podcast with your friends and family We are on Instagram and Twitter at Musafir stories If you like this podcast don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or the website. Follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. Music